this morning. Turn in your Bibles. Uh, we are continuing in Acts chapter 9. This wonderful passage that we're doing now, which deals with the conversion and the beginning of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and this time in this time in this, the narrative, he's still known as Saul. So uh, we are we're doing an interesting part of it this morning. Um, there, there's a couple of kind of unique and nerdy things, but you know me, I like nerdy things, so you're going to get them. Uh, we're going to start, just read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll go into it. And just I want you to note that you see there's a subtitle there, A Time to Run. Well, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 in Ecclesiastes, gives us these marvelous pairings of things. A time to be born, a time to die, a plan to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal. And I think I missed something in there, but you get the idea. Uh, we don't have a pairing in Ecclesiastes 3 that has a time to run. So Paul kind of invented something new. A time to preach, a time to run. It's going to be kind of the pattern of his life as we follow him through the, this time. Okay, we are beginning in 19, the second part of, of the verse. Okay, the second half, Pastor John took us through the first half, uh, the first half of the verse last week. And uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to read all of 19 just for context. And immediately something like, oh, that's 18, immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately, focus on that word immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem and of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gate days and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Luke who wrote it. We thank you for Saul or Paul as he would be soon known, who took the dramatic appearance to him to heart and was truly converted, such a conversion, such a change in direction. And Lord, as we look at that, let us learn from some of the things uh, that happened to him and some of the activities he had. We ask for blessing on the time we have this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And that was, we blame that not on technology, we blame that on a fat phone. <laughs> That one was all me. Okay. Uh, so begins a new pattern of life for the Apostle Saul, now an apostle. Only a few days before this, he was hunting. Now things are turning around. He was hunting the heretics. Now he has become an apostate in the eyes of the Jews, and he will be the hunted. He went from predator to prey. There's a little bit of a nerdy note that I kind of mentioned earlier. Between verse 20 and verse 22, there's about three years of time. The writer, Luke, did not seem to see it necessary to include that. I'm not going to let it bother me. I just know it's there, so be aware of that. Uh, we see that proven out in Galatians. We see it proved out in 2 Corinthians, where Paul mentions it himself. And that's why, you, why we know that to be true. Just don't let it get away with where you are on this. As we watch Saul's life through the book of Acts, 
we see that his life now begins this pattern of preach and run. Just seems to be the way it goes. Uh, he proclaims the gospel, and then he has to flee for his life. Sometimes he's helped along the journey. At one time, they dragged him out of the city and stoned him and left him for dead and just left. So then he just picked himself up and went on to the next city. We'll get there eventually. A bit of related history, and again, a little nerdy stuff here. We see that he went into the synagogue. What's a synagogue? We've heard the word before, but now that we've moved away from Jerusalem and we've moved out into the other cities, and we're going to look more into other cities, we really ought to know what a synagogue is. The word really means just assembly, and we as a church are an assembly. When James, in chapter 2, verse 2, says, if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, he talks about not playing favorites there. The word assembly is the same word, synagogue. It, we see it. It's either a group of people gathered together, or more commonly, particularly in the book of Acts, it is the place of assembly. Just like we are a church. The building is a church. We go to the church in Amsterdam. But we also are a body of believers. We are an assembly of believers. We need to know that. Just That's what assembly, the synagogue, is all about. Synagogues, the concept of the synagogue began probably in the Babylonian captivity, where they weren't near the temple. The temple uh, was pretty much wrecked at the time. They wound up <coughs> over in Babylon. They had to do something to keep their faith alive. And they developed this process. It was first of all a gathering of people, and then it was a place. And in that place there would be worship, that there would be scrolls stored and kept there. Because, you know, we can carry a Bible around pretty easily, right? That's pretty easy to carry a Bible. Or more frequently these days, people are carrying a Bible along with other things. Okay. They didn't have it so easy back in those days. There were a lot of scrolls to make up the Old Testament canon. And, oh, that word canon. Commercial for Wednesday nights. <laughs> Don't hear what Pastor Shaw's going to be teaching us about. The canon of Scripture. Okay, great stuff. Uh, so when we see synagogue, think of it as a place of worship. That's what it was all about. It didn't replace the temple. It was something that functioned to give them something to bring them together, a place to bring them together. Uh, so we go into the, the message, the point of the message here. First of all, we see that Saul proclaimed to the Jews. And we have to remember that he was with the disciples in Damascus. That was covered last week by Sean. Okay. What I want you to focus on, and I interrupted my reading to focus on that word, the word immediately. Saul didn't waste any time getting started. Working from a base of now believing Jews, and who knows, there may have been a few Gentile believers in there, we don't know that. He began the pattern of going into the synagogue to reach first the chosen people of God. Boy, that sounds just about like the pattern of Jesus himself. If we look back to Matthew 4.23, speaking of Jesus, he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. We discussed a couple of these things last week, or two weeks ago, I guess it was, the word proclaiming, the underlying word is caruso, and there's a related term, kerygma. These are terms out of the Greek, and I do like to have people know, at least be familiar with some of these things. This concept of kerygma, this is the body of things that make up the orthodox faith. This is the body of beliefs that were taught by the apostles, and no doubt by Paul, Saul, himself, even at this time. These are all the things that collectively we understand as believers. 
we see here in our text, our morning text, that he was proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God. That's point number one in that Bible. At first he reached out to the Jews, those who were actively seeking the Messiah. Remember that the Jews were seeking a Messiah. They may not have had it quite right. They may not have understood exactly what was going on. And over the years, actually, their faith may have been perverted or subverted by some bad teaching here, there, and everywhere. But they were expecting a Messiah. That's critical to know. And now he comes in, Saul comes in, and he preaches that Jesus was the Son of God. This man, Jesus, who we've been fighting against for some time, this man, Jesus, who was hated by the Jews, was the Son of God. This was new information to them. And with that comes the rest of the package of the gospel, the good news. The Son came into the world to redeem the world, to pay the penalty for the sins of the world, that all who believe on him might be saved. And that was something that was brand new. It amazed the Jews. Okay, being amazed by the truth of God is nothing new in the history of the gospel. Once again, we look to the word of Jesus himself, at which the people said, all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Going again to the underlying word, you need not know it. It has its root in the word meaning to stand still. Think about them being stopped in the tracks. That's the concept. That's the word picture that underlies amazed. They've been going about their way. And now they've stopped in their tracks. Things are going to change here at this time. Part of the amazement was the transformation of this man who had been raising havoc on the church. And now he was promoting the church. Now the word havoc shows up only a couple times in the New Testament. Uh, once here and it shows up twice in Galatians 1. And that's where Paul was discussing his activities, his life where he was trying to destroy the church. Same underlying word. So he was trying to destroy the church, raising havoc with the church. And it goes on to say that Saul confounded the Jews. And that word is kind of interesting. The, the word picture there is they just couldn't wrap their heads around the message he was giving them. He was proving that Jesus was the Christ, putting the information out there in such a way that they couldn't go, but, 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 wait, wait, we know it can't. No. He was doing it in such a way, first of all, they were amazed. Secondly, they couldn't refute what he had to say. The Jewish understanding of the Messiah just was wrong. They were expecting a military leader, a political leader, that they, he was going to come in and he was going to kick those nasty Romans out of their world. But that wasn't what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to deal with the problem of sin. All mankind are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can't change that. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the message of the gospel. The gift of God is eternal life. We can get past the problem of sin only because of Jesus Christ. It's not about a new ruler like David or Solomon. It's about a new kingdom, the kingdom of God directly ruled from on high. Jesus had to deal with that and did deal with it. The evils of sin in each of our lives because we all have to deal with that. Every single one of us. And then, pardon the pun, but the rest of this is kind of a letdown. Okay? I heard one chuckle. 
Paul is let down outside the wall through a window in a basket. Now, lest you think, did anybody happen to see the Facebook post I put out yesterday about the basket, Paul being lowered the basket? Well, the basket in that picture is kind of misleading. It shows like the basket maybe the size of this podium and maybe that high or so, and Paul's kind of hanging on the rope of your life. The term that's used that underlies that really is more of a rope basket. And if you've never seen a rope basket, I've used them a few times in my work as an NCON officer. Um, we use them to capture wildlife sometimes. And if you've ever watched videos or movies of when there's a problem bear and they dart it and they tranquilize it up in a tray and they drop it into a rope net, you get about 10 guys around holding the net and theoretically the bear drops in the middle of the net. Okay, you're all laughing. <laughs> my wife's heard this story before. Theoretically, the bear drops in the net, and the 10 guys all around it are able to take up the weight of a 200, 250-pound, 300-pound bear. Problem is, when the bear finally falls asleep, it never cooperates. It doesn't fall straight down. It falls this way, and so we're moving the net all around, trying to stay underneath. You never catch the bear. It looks good. It really looks good. But that's a rope net. That's how heavy a rope net is. They're used for handling cargo on ships and things like that. Just, I thought that might amuse some people and give you a better picture of how he was lowered. And yes, there were often windows built into the wall, windows open directly into houses within the city. Think of Rahab and Jericho. Rahab had a window in the wall. Okay. So it was something that was very common in the old, the, the ancient cities. And Damascus was an ancient city. And interestingly, thinking about this particular piece of the passage, one writer, at least one writer that I found, thinks that Paul, in looking back on this event, looked back on it with a degree of regret. Maybe that's not the right word, but... A, a bit of sorrow because the people he'd been chasing and was more than willing to wrap up in chains or in ropes and drag back to Jerusalem to maybe face death at the hands of the high and mighty Jewish council saved his hide. At least one guy reads that into the accounts in 2 Corinthians and Galatians. We don't see anything of it here but it's an interesting thought to park in the back of your mind and chew on for a while. So the question we always come to is, how do we apply this? This isn't just to read and say, oh, okay, and we can pick out, all right, he preached boldly, all right, we've talked about preaching boldly, and we've talked about all these things over one, of, one time or another, and actually I just looked ahead into next week's message, but that's all right. We'll talk about preaching boldly again. I'll skip it this week. Well, we've talked about so many of these things before, but I want to go back to that word immediately. Get to work. Get to work. There was no time wasted. Saul was converted. He was baptized. He took time for some nourishment. Okay, he got some nourishment and some rest. And then he set to work along with the disciples of Damascus. And it appears from verses 6 to 16 that Ananias gave him his marching orders, direct from God, to carry the name of Jesus before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to suggest, from all I read here and elsewhere, that for the initial period of days, he would have worked with the disciples who were there in Damascus. And I can't prove this to you, but I believe it to be true. He would have been working with the disciples, because that would have given them some what I'll call street creds. Yeah, you, you can't just walk into some place, especially with a reputation that precedes you like he had. You can't just walk into some place and start teaching something, preaching something, proclaiming something that you had been absolutely on the other side of only a few days before. So to begin with, he would have probably had the company of these other believers of the area. 
would have given them better access to the synagogues, better access to the people in the marketplace to just have good conversations. Without their presence, yeah, gaining an audience might have been tough. The message here is, whatever job God has for you, just get at it. And I mean just get at it. And the, the other part of this is, it might start small. We know that Saul increased in strength. He didn't start out full bore. He started out and he increased in strength. He did his job. He gave the message. He served. His ministry expanded from that point on. And ultimately, our goal should really be the same. And if you break down the goal of every person in the church, every believer in the church, our goal should be one, to make disciples of all nations. We can all play a part in this. How do we play a part in this? Well, if you're missing from the equation, somebody else has to take your part. Perfect you know, illustration from this morning. I looked out here and I saw that Alex was missing. Every week, faithfully, Alex comes in and makes the coffee. Somebody else had to pick up and get down and do it. <laughs> I'm assuming nobody else had done it, right, Melissa? Uh, somebody beat me to it. Somebody beat me to it, okay. It somebody me. picked up the slack and did it, but somebody had to step out and do it. Wonderful. I, I don't know who did it, and I'm thanking whoever it was. Okay? Whatever you do, it may not be the part of a preacher, a teacher, or evangelist. Maybe not a deacon, trustee, treasurer, financial secretary, church clerk, any other officers or positions we may have in the church. It may not be anything so glamorous. You know what? We have been benefited all winter long by Ryan and by Hal, who said, oh, I'll come in and make sure the walks are clean. And they do. Every Sunday morning, they're here. Hal didn't feel good. He was still here this morning, so we've been off the walks. Okay. These are things that are important to get a little bit done, because ultimately, it's all about the same goal. The goal is to make disciples. We might even have a bad day here and there. I'm sure over the course of his career, Paul looked at getting let down outside the wall of Damascus, going, yeah, that was not a good day. I'm sure when he looked back at being stoned, that was probably not a good day. Shipwrecked. All the different things. Go to 2 Corinthians. Read the book of 2 Corinthians. You will see a laundry list of the indignities that Saul, Paul suffered. But you know what? He still got up the next day and went on and got about his business. He got started. He did the job. He kept at the job, growing all the way. Wherever you are in your Christian walk, get started. It starts here. Saul met Jesus. He repented and immediately went to work. Immediately, the word means pretty quick. And that was pretty quick. Three days, that's pretty quick. Salvation, baptism, nourishment, and immediately he went to work. A couple of thoughts uh, that I have picked up over the years. A good friend of mine, Rick Kluge, pastor of Northville, or former pastor, retired pastor from Baptist Church in Northville. He said this, if you're saved and not serving, you're sinning. Wow. That's kind of harsh. Yeah. You're saved and not serving, you're sinning. I agree with it. And I'll tell you that salvation without service is selfishness. The other side of this is service without salvation is meaningless. All the good things some people do, and there's a lot of good things people do. I know a lot of people who give, do, provide, and in the eternal scheme of things, it is meaningless if not saved. That's where it has to start. 
Some people are trying to earn their way to heaven. Some people just are misled and think that it's just a good thing to do and they're just going to keep doing it. So first of all, in your life, and you know, knowing everybody here, you've heard this message before, let's deal with the salvation part. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, today is the day to confess, repent, trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's where it has to start. Then comes this process of service and growth. Service and growth. And I'm not going to tell you that one's going to get in front of the other. I think they should be right about in the same package. They should be in the same package. They run hand in hand so often. But I have a caveat. Don't be afraid that God's going to turn you into prey for those who disagree with you. Okay? Why do I say that? Well, it's scary to think about surrendering to Jesus and doing his will. It really is. Probably told pieces of this story before. When my wife was very young, fairly young, teenager, I believe, the pastor, someplace or other, she got very concerned about having to go somewhere like Brazil. Brazil with his bugs and all kinds of critters. And one day, the pastor was giving a message, and it had to do with surrendering and following the will of God. And he goes, it's not like he's going to send you to Africa or something. And she blurted out, you mean Brazil? <laughs> and the pastor went, we'll talk. <laughs> Some years later, we were married, and I, <laughs> I was called to go to Venezuela. I handed her the flyer, that, the, the announcement that essentially said I was going to Venezuela. And she looked at that and said, Venezuela, that's right next to Brazil. <laughs> this isn't funny, Lord. <laughs> Guess what? She went to Venezuela with me. She's been to Guatemala with me. She's been to Costa Rica with me. She's still here with me. Okay. Don't be afraid of it. Whatever God calls you to do, He's going to give you strength to get through it. He will use you for his honor, for his glory, in his service. Don't ever, ever be afraid to surrender and immediately get to work. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the glory that you are. We thank you that you have everything in our lives set for us. <coughs> However you do it, wherever you do it, with whomever you send us. It doesn't matter. We've got it figured out, Lord. We ask your blessing on each of us who has heard this message this morning. We pray that each of us will first of all surrender to your salvation if it's not already been done. And then get to work. Serve, grow, move on, following the pattern that you have for each of our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we uh, close out, I was uh, mentioning that I've been handing out some of the ladies' study books that my wife sent with me. If you haven't got one, I'm supposed to give you one. It's going to be after service. Uh, the directories are available. Oh, and the directories are available on the back of the table, too. I picked one up on the way in so you can have contact information for everybody in the church, emails, and whatever. Um, if you all rise with me, we're going to sing in closing hymn 432 to speak, O Lord.
our ears, close our hearts to what you have to say for us. Let us all see clearly what you have. Lord, bless us now. Dismiss us with your blessing. Keep us safe. We pray that you will protect the rest of us from these bugs that are going around. <clears throat> we pray that you will deal with the, the, the diseases that are in the oven. Get them back with us again next week. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And uh, we turn us together again. We bless the time of fellowship that we have. We thank you for those who provide, for those who serve. And we ask your blessing on that time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.